Um, and so today's lecture is going to be sort of a transition from um, a lot of the stuff that we've been learning, um, you know, as it always is post midterm. But um, I would say that the greatest transition in this class is from like week three to week four, just because um, it goes from material that is, I wouldn't say simple to understand, but um, we're going to be getting into concepts that's going to use a lot more um, calculus based intuition. Um, and so it can be tricky. So I think if there's any time in this course to really kind of bear down, it's going to be this period right now where um, we're going to cover concepts such as substitution and income effect, which um, I think that those are probably going to be the most recurring concepts as we move forward in the class. Um, you really want to make sure that you have those down because they're going to be applied to uh, a number of other concepts throughout the class. Um, another, like when I mean concepts, I guess different topics. So you'll be seeing it a lot. And so I definitely recommend um, sort of just bearing down and getting to understand substitution and income effect uh, as best you can. So with that being said, I want to talk about kind of some of the, the, the framework behind it, some of the ground groundwork. What am I trying to say? Like the base stuff that you really need to know in order to fully understand what's going on. Um, and that kind of goes into the idea of the different kinds of goods that exist in our Econ 10A class, right? So we have normal goods, normal, we have ordinary, we have inferior, and we have Giffen, right? Um, and so these get kind of paired up in um, this class because of the fact that depending on what kind of goods you're working with, different changes in price and in income are going to have various effects, right, uh, on the good, right, as I mentioned before, depending on what it is. So a normal good is a good that you typically see in your day-to-day -day life, right? A normal good is a good in which, um, so I'm going to do the, like, kind of partial derivative definition. So hopefully you guys can see that. I know that it's not the darkest color. Um, but we're going to say that a good is normal when consumption of that good increases as your income increases, right? So that's kind of the verbal definition of what a normal good is. But it's essentially as I get more income, as my level of M increases, I'm going to start to consume more and more of that good, right? So X1 being a normal good. Um, and so kind of the reasoning behind this is um, if you think about your own experience, right? So say you get more money um, and now you're going to be able to afford a car or something like that, right? Um, that's kind of the, the thinking behind what a normal good is. Uh, and we're going to say that, and I'm going to skip one because I like to group normal goods and inferior goods. So I probably should have written, uh, written these two together. But basically an inferior good is going to be the opposite of a normal good, right? Meaning that as my income increases, I'm actually going to be consuming less and less of those goods. And so something that is typically inferior may be like top ramen. So maybe as uh, you start to gain more money, you pick up a full-time job or something, um, you're going to be consuming less and less of these instant meals, right? You're going to start to buy uh, maybe more expensive ingredients. Um, so I like to group these two together. And I also like to group these two together because the normal and inferior are going to be subject to uh, income increases or decreases, right? So basically they're dependent on your income. Whereas ordinary and Giffen, as we're going to see in just a minute, are going to be dependent on our um, price changes. So we're going to say that an ordinary good is a good in which you start to consume less as the price of that good uh, increases. So essentially, if you think about how um, you might be operating at a grocery store, right? Um, if the price of hot dogs increases, then you're going to start to consume less hot dogs, right? Meaning that hot dogs in this instance are an ordinary good. And so 
most goods in, in your day-to-day -day life, I would say, are normal and ordinary, so they follow those patterns. Um, but it is important to note the kind of distinction between the three, uh, and hopefully you guys can start to develop a better understanding of what these partial derivative signs mean in the context of uh, kind of the economic backgrounds behind it. Um, and a Giffen good is actually going to be a very unique good in that um, it's a good in which you consume more as the price of that good uh, increases, right? Which is a little bit counterintuitive to think of at the very uh, beginning, um, but a kind of an example that I think is used in lecture and that I also like to use as well is that um, say that you're currently say that you're currently uh, eating top ramen six days a week and uh, on your seventh day you save up for maybe uh, a nice lobster meal or whatever extravagant meal you want to think of. Um, however, when the price of top ramen starts to increase, well, you're no longer going to be able to afford that seventh, um, or I guess that nice meal on the seventh day. And so you're essentially going to be forced to consume more of the top ramen um, because of the fact that the, uh, the nice meal was sort of, sort of pushed, pushed out of the rotation, if that makes sense. Um, so that's kind of like an, a weird instance in which that happens. Um, we like to think of Giffen goods as being a type of inferior good, right? Um, so inferior in that it's something that isn't really desirable. Um, but um, yeah, so these are kind of the definitions that, that follow with the, the various goods. Um, these definitely are very important. So typically we assume that goods are going to be normal uh, unless stated otherwise. Um, but in a situation in which there is a distinction made between the various goods, you definitely want to be uh, aware of what what it is that changes uh, consumption of those goods, right? So for normal and inferior, it's gonna be changes in income. And for ordinary and Giffen, it's gonna be changes in prices. Okay, um, so that's it for the various goods, um, or I guess it's not quite it, because there are another subset of goods that I do wanna talk about, um, but I'm gonna erase this for now. So hopefully you guys all have this written down. And the goods that we're actually going to be talking about now are um, things that we've actually seen before, and hopefully you guys are somewhat familiar with them already. And they're going to be the substitutes, substitutes, and complements, right? Um, and so you've seen these in the context of like perfect complements and perfect substitutes, where uh, changes in price, right, was was something that could drive consumption of one of the goods to zero. Um, but these are a little bit looser in, in what they do, meaning that uh, if you increase the price of one good, it's not like you're going to completely substitute that good for the other or vice versa. Um, it's going to lead to a decrease, but not all the way down to zero, or it doesn't necessarily need to be driven down to zero. Um, and so hopefully you guys will be able to see what I mean. Um, given kind of the definition that follows. So we consider a uh, good one to be a substitute good when um, the change in consumption of good one uh, increases or actually it decreases when, actually, da, 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 yeah, no, it would increase, sorry. Um, I get a little bit tripped up in my wording, but Essentially, what this means is that um, my consumption of good one will increase as the price of good two increases, right? So um, notice how in this situation, we're dealing with the price of the other good. So we would consider that cross price um, just for kind of reference. When, uh, when we're dealing with the price of the other good, we call that cross price. Um, and that's uh, juxtaposed to own price, right? So. Uh, the normal, inferior, ordinary, and Giffen goods, right? So we think about the ordinary and Giffen, those were own price because it was with respect to the price of the, the good itself, right? This is the price of the other good. And I know that I say good a lot in this case just because I can't think of another word that would really replace that. Um, but that's essentially what I'm trying to say with that. So this is cross price. And um, 
to in order to kind of contextualize this, think of right the classic grocery store example. Uh, I am stuck between hot dogs and hamburgers. I kind of view them as being uh, substitutes for each other. And what I mean by that is, if the price of hamburgers goes up, I'm gonna start to consume more hot dogs, right, as a result. Um, and this, right, is different than compliments in that a compliment is a good that um, when the price of good two increases, I'm actually going to consume less of good uh, good one. And so in this situation, we think of maybe like hot dogs and hot dog buns, um, where when um, we see an increase in the price of hot dog buns, um, we're going to be affording less hot dog buns as a result. But also because we eat them together, right, um, we're going to see a decrease in the consumption of hot dogs um, as well. Um, and so notice that this is cross price also. Um, so this is kind of the framework that we're gonna be working with uh, when we talk about substitution and income effect. Um, are there any questions about any of like the various goods that I've just kind of gone over? Um, I think that it's important to be familiar with it um, and be able to kind of read out what each of these notations mean um, out loud. So, um, because I don't see anything popping up in the chat, I'm going to assume that you guys are good with that. Uh, and I'm going to move on into kind of the meat and potatoes of what I wanted to talk about today. Um, so we're going to try to cover a lot today. Um, whether I'm able to, to kind of go over everything or not, I'm not too sure. But um, anything that I don't cover, I'll, I'll talk about on uh, Wednesday's lecture. So looking at substitute, and income effect, right? We're typically going to uh, abbreviate this as substitution effect, income effect, um, and then there's gonna be a third one called total effect where um, we say that the combination of substitution effect plus income effect equals total effect. So I'm sure that you guys have seen this already, um, but uh, this is kind of just like a mathematical fact, what do you call that? Like a principle? Um, essentially this always holds is what I'm trying to say. Um, so kind of the intuition behind substitution and income effect is that um, when we're dealing with uh, price changes or income changes, right? Typically it's gonna be a price change, you'll see. Um, there's a few different things that go on, right? And so these are, these are aspects that we typically don't notice uh, in our day-to-day -day life, right? Simply because we don't notice like the intermediate effects of what happens, right? So um, I'm gonna kind of provide an example. So suppose that I have an optimal bundle that is comprised of oranges and t-shirts, right? Kind of an, a random bundle, but that's what the bundle is. Now I experience an increase in the price of t-shirts, right? And so what goes on here, right? There's two different effects that are occurring, but that we usually don't notice. So typically um, what, we'll, what you'll notice, right? And this is ignoring all of the intermediate steps that occur is that I go from one optimal bundle to the other, right? Um, so we go from optimal bundle one to optimal bundle two. Uh, and we typically don't think about what's going on here, right? Um, but it's really important to note that behind all of this, right, kind of like the, the background workings, there's an intermediate step that occurs right over here, right? So, um, and this is kind of a roughly drawn diagram, but essentially when I see that increase in the price of t-shirts, right, the substitution effect is gonna be one of the intermediate steps. And essentially what that is, is saying that now t-shirts are more expensive to uh, oranges prior to what they were before, right? So there's a substitution effect that I'm making between the two goods there, right? But also as a result, there's gonna be an income effect because if t-shirts are more expensive, 
right? If you think about it in terms of what I'm able to afford, right? Um, and so you, typically you can think about it as purchasing power, right? But what I'm able to afford is also less, meaning that there's an income effect as well, right? And just saying it out loud doesn't probably relate to you guys at all. Um, you're probably still trying to think about what I'm trying to say, but this is essentially me trying to say that um, with every change in price and every change in income, all we see is the steps from one to two, right? But we don't notice all of the uh, things that go on kind of in between that. And so that's what substitution and income effect is at the heart of it, right? Um, and so I'm gonna go into more of what it means uh, kind of going now, or I guess going for, forward from now, right? So I think that it's always best to look at it graphically because that tells you the most what's going on. Um, and I think that it's easiest to explain what's going on, right? So, and I'm gonna try to make it in as many colors as I can. So let's say that we have a budget constraint that looks like this, right? And we've already chosen an optimal bundle, right? So something that looks like this, right? And this is a problem that you've probably solved a million times. This is simply just an optimizing bundle based on an MRS and based on a price ratio, right? So we call this bundle A, okay? Now, let's say that the price of good one is increasing, right? And so when the price of good one increases, what happens to the budget constraint? Well, the budget constraint is gonna pivot from X2 and sh uh, pivot a little bit inwards so that we get something that looks like this, right? And um, what you see, right, typically, and um, this is kind of to illustrate what kind of goes on in your mind, right? What you'll notice is that we're simply going to pick a new optimal bundle based on our new MRS and um, based off of the kind of price ratio that is uh, given by the, the change in price, right? So we're gonna see something that is gonna look like this, right? And typically when we think of this, this is A and this is B, but what this point really is, is point C, which implies that there's gonna be a point B that we're gonna wanna kind of discover. Hello. And so um, looking at what we have right here, right? This is the optimal bundle with the first set of prices. And this is the optimal bundle with the second set of prices. But there's this third bundle that we're gonna need to find out, right? And that's gonna be the bundle that is gonna kind of cover what substitution effect really is, right? So um, I said that substitution effect was uh, essentially, I, I didn't really explain it too well um, because it was more so to kind of cover the fact that there are things that go on behind the scenes um, but what substitution effect really does is it says, if I maintain the same amount of utility that I previously was uh, experiencing, but I also change the prices, how does that price change um, affect how I choose between X1 and X2? <laughs> and so um, it's kind of a way of isolating the price change um, without dealing with any of the income related stuff, right? So um, and I think that this itself is like the hardest thing to explain is that su what substitution effect is really meant to do is isolate the change in price. So isolate the effect of the change in price while <sighs> the income isn't a factor. Is in the bush light box. Um, and so. <laughs> yeah. No. I'm yeah, there we go. Um, so essentially, if you think about the words that I just said, so keeping utility the same while factoring in the change in prices, um, I think that that's kind of a clue as to where point B is gonna be, but I'm just gonna kind of tell you right away like how it is that you find point B. So point B, if you remember, is gonna have the same utility as point A. And I think that's the biggest thing that um, is like, kind of forgotten is that because I'm maintaining the same amount of utility, 
it's going to be on the same indifference curve, right? Um, and because we're factoring in the prices, that means that it's going to have the same price ratio as point C, right? So what we're going to get is something that looks like this, right? Where we're going to find a new uh, tangent point while keeping the slope the same, right? So essentially what we're going to have here is a new point on this first indifference curve, right? That maintains the same utility as A, um, but also has the same slope as point C, right? And um, here, I'll write some kind of things about it that hopefully will kind of stick with you guys. So the utility of A is equal to the utility of B and the slope at B is equal to the slope at C, right? And these are things that are always going to be true when we're dealing with these Cobb-Douglas indifference curves, right? Um, and so, right, just to kind of cover what I've talked about so far and like what is going on with this uh, problem in particular. So finding point A is easy, right? Finding point A is, has nothing to do with substitution and income effect. It has everything to do with what we've learned in weeks one through three, right? Um, so finding point A is easy. Now, we have to kind of think about what happens, right, when I keep my utility the same, but I also experience a change in price, right? Well, the change in price is going to mean that I have a new price ratio. And so that's what's shown in this slope right here. This is the slope of the new budget constraint, which is right over here, right? Um, and so because the slope is steeper, right? And so this kind of tells you where A is or where B is relative to A. Because this, the new slope is steeper, that's going to tell us that point B is going to be at a point that's higher than point A because of the fact that we have DMRS, right? So you're probably thinking, where does DMRS come into this? Well, if the slope of uh, B is steeper than the slope of A, that means that B has to be to the left and up of A, right? Because of the fact that as we move further along, the slope decreases, right? And so that kind of gives us a rough idea of where B is. Um, and it also kind of allows us to pinpoint where A is or where B is relative to A and C. So we know that B is on the same indifference curve as A. And we know that we can find point C in the same way that we found point A, right? And so with that said, A and C are going to be easy to find. It's going to be B that's going to give you guys the most trouble, right? Um, and so just to kind of illustrate which is which, or like which effect is which, um, we say that going from point A to B is going to be the substitution effect. Going from B to C is going to be the income effect. And going from A to C is the total effect, right? And in real life, what we usually see is just going from A to C, um, which is the total effect. But this is kind of just to say that there's going to be two steps that go before this. Um, and let's see, there, I, I got some questions in the chat. Um, should the verse of vertical asymptote for the line with point C be less than? Um, yeah, I think that. It technically should be. This is like a really roughly drawn drawing. So I wouldn't take it with, um, I would take it with a grain of salt as to what it actually is. I think that um, if we're talking about it in like how it should be drawn accurately, I think C really should be to the left of B. Um, it's just kind of an error in drawing. And so um, let me actually, to kind of clear up confusion as to what I'm trying to say, um, I'm going to redraw it. So we have original budget constraint, we have new budget constraint, and I'm going to draw them a little bit further apart. So this is A. Um, we know that this is going to have the same slope. So assume that this dashed line has the same slope as this line right here. So this is going to be point B, and this is going to be point C, 
right? So this is probably a more accurate drawing of what um, is really going on. So in the other drawing, I had C to the right of B, um, which, you know, I think that for a rough drawing doesn't really matter, but um, you're gonna be asked questions about where one point is relative to the, to the other. And so having accurate drawings probably is the best way to go about it. Um, and you also said that since as the price decreases, you have to decrease income as well. Um, so not necessarily, and it's actually a price increase. So the, the income doesn't decrease, right? It's what we can do with that income is that's going to decrease, right? So our income stays the same, but what we're able to buy is what's, uh, also is, is what's actually decreasing. So, um, for some solution effect though, when you have to do that, um, you have to decrease the income that price sort of decrease because by decreasing the, uh, the income, you're saying that you're not going to get any more buying power out of it. So you're not doing anything with income per se, right? Income is going to stay the same. Um, it, it's all about purchasing power, as you mentioned before. And so um, if you guys have noticed in lecture, there's two different kinds of substitution effects and income effects. There's like Slutsky, I believe, and then there's Hicks. And so I believe that the Slutsky method keeps inc or changes the value of income or something of that sort. Um, but in the class, we use the Hicks substitution income effect. Uh, and what that does is it actually maintains utility um, as opposed to income. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, but yeah, so I think that these are going to be the main takeaways that you're going to want to come up with or walk away with is that the utility at point A is going to be the same as the utility at point B, which implies they're on the same indifference curve, right? And the slope at point B is going to be the same as the slope of point C, meaning that they have the same price ratio. Okay, um, and I think that if you know these two two things, that's going to allow you to solve a lot of problems. Now, there still is a lot of conceptual stuff that's going to going to kind of go on, um, but um, I think that this this information is really really useful to know. Um, also, one of the things that I personally do. And I think that uh, it probably is useful to you guys as well is I like to chart it out. I like to chart out what each of my income effects and substitution effects are. Um, and so when you're, when you're given numbers, this will probably be easier to evaluate. Um, but because this is left in a very general form, all we can do is really uh, show direction. So in this case, um, the substitution effect for good one decreases, right? So as you can see, going from A to B, I get a decrease in good one, and I get an increase in good two, right? So I go from here to here. And um, what you'll notice is that going from B to C, we actually get a decrease in both, the right, both directions, or I guess, yeah, we get a decrease in X1 and a decrease in uh, X2. And so because we know that the total effect is the substitution effect plus income effect, I'm going to know that the total effect for good one is definitely going to be downward sloping, right? Um, but that the total effect for good two is going to be undetermined, right? Um, and so what I want to say, there's actually a few things that I, I kind of forgot that I do want to say, is that the substitution effect is always going to point away from the more expensive good. And that's not expensive in terms of absolute value. Um, it's expensive in terms of like relative to what it was before, right? And so what I mean by that is that, right, because the price of good one increases, right, we're gonna say that it's now more expensive to what it was before, right? And so that's kind of what I mean by that. Um, and essentially what that's saying is that um, whenever one of the prices goes up, we're going to say that the substitution effect for that good is going to go down, right? Um, and we're always going to have it so that the substitution effect for each good points in different directions, right? So if the substitution effect for a good one points downwards, then the substitution effect for a good two points up, upwards, right? Um, and vice versa. Um, and so that's all going to be dependent on which of the prices increased or which of the prices decreased, right? Um, also, what I wanted to talk about with income effect is that you notice that both of them go down. And so 
the reason that both of those go down is because what I mentioned before is that um, when one of the goods is now more expensive, that means that we are able to buy less of each good as a result, right? So um, essentially your purchasing power does go down in this case. Um, and so that's why we see that both of the arrows go down. Um, and there's actually a way of solving these tiebreakers. So uh, you notice that the arrows for substitution and income effect point in different directions. And uh, in a situation where we're given numerical values for uh, each of these like P1, X1, P2, X2, right? Say that we're given numbers, right? We're always gonna be able to fully fill out this chart. Um, but when we're given more of a conceptual question, um, we have instances in which you don't quite know. And actually there's a really good resource that, um, I'm actually gonna pull it up right now because I think that it's good for you guys to know. I'm gonna share my screen. This is like an Econ 10A um, website that was made before I kind of started working, but Weebly Econ 10A. And so what this does is it actually um, allows you to kind of figure out the tiebreakers that exist. So let's look out. And also, if you guys if you guys haven't checked out this website, I do think it's a really useful resource. But I think that this like elimination method video, I believe, uh, is able to tell you how the um, how we're going to be able to combat this situation in which we have arrows pointing in different directions. So, uh, yeah, I believe that there's a video for um, how we, how we kind of navigate around these tiebreakers, right? Um, so I definitely would check this video out uh, or check this website out just in general because I do think it's really useful. Um, and I'll actually, I'll probably go over it on Wednesday. I'm gonna take a better look at this and, and go over which of the tiebreakers exist. Um, but yeah, I do think that this is a very useful resource, this website. Uh, and I see some questions in the chat. Yeah, so um, we get some more kind of people agreeing that this is a really useful website. Okay. Um, so definitely check that out. Um, well, I had just one quick question or just, this is also conceptual, but so if the price of good one falls, um, for normal goods, the income effect would be positive, right? Because you'd have more yeah. income. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. That, on the quiz so, today, they like contradicted that. So that was a that was a good question that was just asked. Um, and this is essentially if the price of good one had uh, decreased instead of increased, we would have seen a situation in which we have a positive income effect for both goods. Um, so. Uh, yeah, kind of the opposite of what's going on. Uh, yeah, if someone wants to link that website, it's Weebly Econ 10A. You really just have to Google that and you sh that should be the first link that pops up. Um, but I want to kind of put this aside for now. This is totally something that we're going to revisit. Um, and we're going to get a lot of problems, believe me, about this. Um, but I want to talk about buying and selling. So uh, buying and selling actually... I would say doesn't require too much uh, knowledge of substitution and income effects. Um, but I do think that it is fairly useful in knowing. So um, buying and selling. So this is like a really short unit that is kind of covered in about one lecture's worth of material. Um, and the reason why is because I think that it, it's very similar to what was covered in week one to three. Um, so I think that you guys should be fairly comfortable with this. Um, but essentially in a buying and selling model, we assume, so the assumption is we start with bundle and we're gonna call this bundle Omega one, Omega two. And I think that when you think about a buying and selling model, uh, you think about like, if you're like a farmer, for instance, in which uh, 
omega-1 and omega-2 is maybe like the food that you buy at your farm, right? And so um, essentially you start off with omega-1 and omega-2, and those are just values for X1 and X2. Um, but you're able to go to like a market and you're able to uh, sell omega-1 and omega-2 to get the optimal value of X1 and X2, or I guess optimal bundle, I should say, of X1 and X2 based on what um, your preferences are and based on what the prices are. So um, I think that kind of what, what you'll see with this is that, um, and here, let me just cover one of the important equations that go along with this. So P1 X1 plus P2 X2 equals M. And that's all something that we should already know. But what this is also equal to is P1 omega 1 plus P2 omega 2, okay? And so essentially what this means is that when you multiply um, everything together, both of those are going to add up to M. And so we're going to be able to redistribute um, our income to get an optimal amount of each good. So um, let's say that we have something that looks like this, where this is M. This is just uh, the amount of income that we have. And so we know that the slope is negative P1 over P2, right? Theoretically, if we're given this, if we're given this uh, omega 1 and omega 2, we're actually going to be able to go to the market and purchase the optimal amount of X1 and X2. So we'll call that X1 star and X2 star, right? Meaning that because this point costs the same as this point, we're able to go from here to here, which is a more optimal allocation, right, of X1 and X2, okay? Um, and so let's do a problem that um, actually encapsulates this with real uh, numbers. So here, let's see if I have enough room for this. Let's say that omega one is equal to four, omega two is equal to three, P one is equal to five, and P two is equal to four, right? And let's say that my utility is equal to X one and X two, meaning that we have a Cobb Douglas situation, right? Um, what I like to do first, and what I think you guys should do is draw this out on a graph. So X1, X2. Um, and you're also going to be able to determine your income, right? Here, let me point this light away. Hopefully that's a little bit better. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Is it fine? All right, awesome. Um, but because we know what omega-1, omega-2, P1, and P2 are, we actually know what our income is. And so all we have to do is really just multiply omega one by P one and add that to omega two times P two. And we get that M is equal to 32, right? And so from here, we're able to draw our intercepts. So we know that we have an intercept here at X two is equal to eight. And we also have an intercept here at X one is equal to 32 over five. Right, so it's about six-ish. Um, and so we draw a line that connects the two and we note that our starting bundle is roughly, and I'm gonna draw this in a different color. We know that our starting bundle is gonna be roughly here. Right, this is where we start off with, um, but that's not necessarily where we're gonna end up with, right? So. Um, in this situation, we want to find our optimal bundle. And so really all that's going to be is setting my MRS equal to my price ratio and plugging that back into my budget constraint, right? So 5x1 five, five is going to be equal to 4x2, meaning that um, x1 is equal to 4x2 over 5, right? 
you plug that back into our budget constraint. And I know that I'm running out of room a little bit, but I'm gonna try to make this work. So we get five times X1, and we know that X1 is just this value right here. So four X2 over five, the fives are gonna cancel out, plus four X2 is gonna be equal to 32. And so we get that eight X2 is equal to 32, meaning that X2 star, meaning the optimal value of X2 is gonna be equal to four. And um, actually, hopefully, hopefully you guys are able to see this. Uh, I know that it kind of looks small on the board, um, but essentially I get that X2 star, and I'm just gonna write this right here, is equal to four, meaning that X1 star is gonna be equal to four times four over five, which is gonna be 16 over five, right? And so if I reallocate, my resources, right? I reallocate the level of M that I have. I get that my optimal bundle is gonna be somewhere, right? Where X1 is gonna be slightly greater than three and that X2 is gonna be equal to four. So this is more, more or less, or not more or less, it is exactly my optimal bundle, meaning that I started here, but I ended up here, right? Um, and this is kind of just more of a conceptual question, but in this, in this scenario, would the consumer be a buyer or a seller of X2? So feel free to answer first that. Point, in the chat. At the first point or the second point? Um, so going from where he started off with to where he ended up with, is he a buyer or is he a seller of, of good one? A buyer because the price decreased. So, um, I kind of see where you're, where you're going with this, right? Um, but think about where he ended up with. So he ended up here and he started here, meaning that he started off with four units of good one and he ended up with 16 over five units of good one, right? And so essentially he gave away, so he sold units of good one in order to get more units of good two. So in this case, he was a, yeah. he was a seller, right? Yeah. Um, the quantity increase, not the price. Yeah, exactly. And so uh, more, more of a general kind of statement I'm making here is that if you're a buyer of one good, you have to be a seller of the other good, right? Um, because we assume that income stays constant throughout, right? Um, Wait, can you give that explanation again real quick of why, why he's a buyer or why he's a seller? What? Yeah, so he's going to be a seller of good one. And the way that we know this is because he actually ends up with less good one than he started off with, right? Meaning that when he went to the market, he took some of his good one and he sold it for more units of good two. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, and so vice versa is that he went to the market and he, um, I guess he, so if for example, we were asking, is he a buyer or seller of good two? Well, he definitely bought units of good two and sold units of good one, right? So um, that's what I mean that uh, you're either a buyer, so you're either a buyer or a seller of one good, meaning that uh, if you're a buyer of one good, you're a seller of the other good. Um, and so another thing that I want to note is that um, when it comes to these sort of questions, um, the value of your endowment is actually more important to the uh, kind of utility that you have. Here, let me think of a way to rephrase this. So um, let's say, for example, that my endowment, so I'm trying to figure out where to write this. I'm going to erase this right here. Let's say that, for example, my endowment had been five units of good one and two units of good two, right? In this instance, would I be better off or worse off um, than if I had my original endowment? Sorry, what exactly is an endowment? So the endowment is essentially your starting bundle. Um, 
And so I like to think of it as like the farm example where the endowment is pretty much what you grow on your farm. And so after you've grown everything, you have a responsibility to kind of sell those whatever fruit or plants or whatever you sell um, at the market to get a more optimal level of what you want for yourself. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. And so so my question to you guys is if I have this new endowment, am I better off or worse off? Right. Um, And why? So I want you guys to actually answer this question um, because I think that this, this question really encapsulates a lot about what we've learned so far in this class. So better or worse, and then why? And then feel free to answer this in the chat. Yeah, so I'm seeing an answer from Sam that perfectly explains what I'm trying to say. Um, And actually, Amy, you had the right idea. I think that you just miscalculated. Um, But essentially, and you'll notice that 5.2, the point 5.2 is actually further away from from the optimal point that I had before, right? So 5.2 is about over here. But what you notice, and I think that this may be a little bit hard to see, is that this 0.52 is actually on a different budget constraint than what 4.3 was on, right? Um, And so kind of when you're on a higher budget constraint, that essentially allows you to be on a higher indifference curve, right? And so essentially, um, I now, and it doesn't really matter what you start off with, right? I could have been here or here, right? Both, all of three of these points that I've just kind of drawn are going to be better than the endowment that I have. And the reason why is because it's going to allow me to have a higher level of M, right? So um, ignore these points for now. So whatever these were. Um, when I have this bundle, 5, 2, my M becomes 33, right? Which means that I can now afford more of each good. And... Um, essentially, I'm on a higher indifference curve as a result. So um, it doesn't really matter what your endowment is, right? Whether you have more of good one or more of good two, it really only matters what your value of the endowment is. Does that make sense? So essentially, um, it's the value of your endowment that's going to result in you having higher or lower utility. All right. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Um, okay. Yeah. So seems that it makes sense. And for those that it doesn't make sense for, um, definitely feel free to like speak up because I could see how it would be a confusing thing. Um, but, um, it is 150, and I think that I'll save the rest for tomorrow, or not tomorrow, Wednesday's lecture, uh, where I'm going to talk about labor supply. And I think that um, the concept of substitution and income effect, I don't, I personally don't think that I communicated it as well as I possibly could have. So um, I think that when you see it with real numbers, it'll make more sense what's going on. Um, but um, Yeah, so that's going to be saved for Wednesday's lecture. Uh, And for Oscar, yes, you're you're correct. So the value of the endowment increases. All right. Um, So you guys are free to go. Um, I'll be around for a few more minutes, um, or I guess as long as anybody has questions, because I do have drop-in at 2, so... Um, I'll be on until three, uh, but I think it's a different link for my drop-in. I'm not quite sure, but yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Ron. Uh.
Hey, Eric. Yeah, what's up, Amy? Hey, I have a question for you. So I was going over my econ midterm and I did so poorly, I think because of the time constraints and not being able to go back and forth, I just had to like get as far as I could before moving on to the next question, right? Mm, yeah. Um, but I mean, it looks like I, I, mean, I understand the concepts and stuff, but there's a few questions that I'm not, that I am kind of stuck on. Okay. Is, is, can I like email you like a picture of where I'm stuck or how do I get help with that? Cause I'm having trouble with like, um, like getting TA office hours and stuff. So, I mean, you could ask me right now. Um, I, okay. I don't mind, I don't mind uh, answering. You could okay. also email it um, as well. It's up to you. Is that, okay, because I have my next class at, um, for statistics at two. Um, okay. All is right. that um, a bother for me to email you or? No, it's no problem. You know, honestly, I, I would really encourage you to. Okay, that would be so cool. I don't want to take up other people's time either in here <laughs> for stuff I that mean, they. I think that for people that are staying around, um, they would definitely be open to hearing what the question is because I think that's just more material for them, but I, I don't want to speak for them. Um, okay. But okay. maybe if you guys want to comment, if like what you guys want. Um, okay. Actually, let um, me stop recording.